failure during LVAP implantation. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. This is the outline of my talk. First, I will try to make you familiar with the paradoxical role of the right ventricle in LVAT surgery. Second, I will elaborate the pathophysiology of the right ventricle in heart failure and during and post LVAT implantation. Last, the knowledge about the specific pathophysiology will allow us to target prevention and treatment of RV failure. At first sight, it might be surprising that we have to take the right ventricle into consideration at all. As you all know, there's a considerable number of patients now reaching late adulthood in which the right, ven right ventricle has been excluded from the venous and pulmonary circulation and in which the pulmonary bloodstream is completely passive. Moreover, we are all familiar with LVAT patients that are fine despite ventricular fibrillation. That means in which RV function seems to be dispensable. On the other hand, we know that the right ventricle has various very important functions in patients with an LVAT. First, the right ventricle accommodates venous return and helps to decrease central venous pressure and to improve organ perfusion. Second, the right ventricle helps to overcome an elevated PVR. And third, as a consequence of the first two points, the right ventricle is a preload reservoir for the elva. And in fact, we know from the literature that a considerable number of patients do suffer from RV failure after implantation of a left ventricular assist device. Most recent data come from the Euromax registry in which nearly, nearly 3,000 patients were analyzed. The primary outcome was early, that means within 30 days, severe postoperative right heart failure, defined as receiving short or long-term right-sided mechanical circulatory support, the continuous inotropic support for more than 14 days, and ino uh, ventilation with inhaled nitric oxide for 48 hours or longer. Interestingly, LVAT implantation was complicated by right heart failure in 433 patients. That means an incidence of 21.7%. This in the early 30 days post LVAT period. Diagnosis of right heart failure was based on the need for postoperative mechanical RV support in 7.1% of the patients the need for prolonged postoperative inotropic support in 16% of the patients and the need for prolonged NO ventilation in 1% of the patients. RV failure is an important driver of mortality. This is again underlined by data from the Euromax registry in which approximately 2,700 uh, 2, patients were analyzed. Approximately one out of five patients die within 90 days after LVAT implantation. Right heart failure was the main cause, cause of death in 8% of the patients. The consequences of RV failure are dramatic. This is a comprehensive overview of all the consequences associated with RV failure and LVAT surgery. RV failure is associated with an increase in mortality perioperatively at the short term and in the long term and even post transplant. Moreover, RV failure decreases survival to transplantation, increases morbidity by increasing the incidence of acute renal failure, of sepsis, of um, stroke and of bleeding. And last but not least, the occurrence of RV failure is associated with an increase in the length of stay, both in the ICU and in the hospital. So how can we now explain the obvious contradiction that the RV on the one hand obviously behaves as a passive conduit, 
but is on the other hand an important part of circulatory homeostasis determining the prognosis of our patients. The answer lies in the immediate impact of the LVAT on RV afterload, preload and contractility. In order to understand this, it is of critical importance to elaborate right ventricular physiology, which I will do in the next slides. Let us first have a look at what happens to the right ventricle in left ventricular failure. LV failure necessitating an LVAT is characterized by forward failure. Forward failure means that the left ventricle cannot get rid any longer from its preload. As a consequence, LVEDP and LVEDV increase and backward failure results. This, this leads to an increase in left atrial pressures and ultimately in an increase of pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and pulmonary arterial pressure. As such, pulmonary hypertension ensues, with, which represents an increase in right ventricular afterload. Due to its specific anatomy and its poor contractile reserves, the right ventricle is extremely susceptible for elevations in afterload. Only small increases in right ventricular afterload result already in dramatic decreases in right ventricular output. Once RV output in decreases, this leads to right ventricular dilatation. As a consequence, the tricuspid annulus will dilate and cause tricuspid regurgitation. This in turn will lead to a backward failure of the right ventricle with venous congestion. Let me also highlight the fact that LV failure will also lead to right ventricular contractile failure. The underlying pathologic process may also affect the myocardium of the right ventricle, e.g., for example, in cardiomyopathy and in ischemia. Also very important, left ventricular dysfunction can be associated with a decrease in blood pressure and hence in the driving pressure for right ventricular coronary perfusion. Diastolic ventricular interaction is also a very uh, co uh, important concept with which, with which you have to get familiar. As you all know, both the left ventricle and the right ventricle are surrounded by the relatively stiff pericardium. Hence, any increase in the volume of one heart chamber is only possible at the expense of the other chamber. Therefore, dilation of the left ventricle will lead to leftward septal shift, which results in a decrease of RV diastolic function and systolic function. These are very fascinating diffusion tensor magnetic resonance images demonstrating orientation of myosid fibers. From the figure, it is evident that fibers cross from the parietal wall of the left ventricle to the right ventricle. It is important to note that 30% of RV pressure and stroke volume are generated by the left ventricle. Septal dysfunction and septal shifting will inevitably lead to an altered septal geometry and a decrease in septal function, which in turn jeopardizes RV output. What happens now to the right ventricle after implantation of an LVAT? The LVAT leads to an immediate unloading of the left ventricle, which also results in an immediate decrease of pulmonary vascular resistance. As a consequence, this enables the near complete resolution of secondary pulmonary hypertension, even in cases of fixed pulmonary hypertension, and even in patients in which heart transplantation would have otherwise been deemed contraindicated due to elevated pulmonary pressures. However, there are two important caveats. First, the time cost of pulmonary hypertension resolution is unpredictable in these patients as the reversal of structural 